there, it's Jason Stahl with another episode of Body Shop Business, the podcast. And I am very pleased today to have on Chris White, who is the president of Kiko Body Repair Products. How you doing, Chris? Good, Jason. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Didn't see you too long ago at the uh, Southeast Collision Conference. That's right. Yeah. No, it seems like we are running in the same circles. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, Chris, uh, I was reading a little bit about your background and you seem like somewhat of an entrepreneur. So my first question, I want to ask you, how did Kiko Body Repair Products come about? Um, tell me a little bit about the history of it and how this company originated. Yeah. So uh, that, that's that's one of my favorite questions to answer, Jason, in, in the fact that uh, so Kiko uh, actually, this uh, Kiko as a company, as a corporation, has been in existence for this is our 60th year. Uh, we're, we're celebrating 60 years of manufacturing. But uh, the body repair product side, our branded products, was started in 2009. Um, and, and the way that that happened was... You know, I started in 1994 as an engineer with Kiko. It was my first job out of college. Um, didn't, uh, there was a family business, but I wasn't in the family. And so somehow I'm going to say by the grace of God, the guy that owned the business decided to sell me the business rather than give it to his children. And that was 2004. Um, and then we, it had, it was a contract manufacturing business, meaning that we made plastic parts for other people's products, which is a nice business, but it's sort of what I would call low margin and not as much fun in the fact that you don't have your own branded products and you're not, um, you're, you're sort of subject, uh, to, um, small margins, I would say, uh, at times because you're, uh, a, you're a part of somebody's bill of materials rather than making a, your own product. And so, Everybody that does that kind of work always wants to have their own products, and so so did we. Uh, but you have to be intentional about it. And so I love New Year's, and 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 literally it was the end of two thousand eight, the beginning of two thousand nine, um, that I came in January second because you don't work January first. And I told everybody that we work that worked for us that we are no longer just a contract manufacturer. We are a branded products company. And they said, well, whatever, Chris, we don't make anything. And we started making all sorts of things. I made practice golf balls, golf tees. I had a friend that was in the coffee business and I made a kind of a unique plastic mug. I also had uh, an employee at the time who brought me a, a plastic tab uh, that was made by the German company Worth. And uh, he said, look, these are, you know, they sell for like $2 a piece. Right. You know, and, and I said, well, I don't know anything about that business. Um, but that's interesting. And I got to thinking about it and there was a gentleman, uh, that, uh, was one of our customers that I knew his son had a paintless dent repair business. And, uh, so I asked for that gentleman to introduce me, Raymond, to introduce me to his son, Sid Emmer, who had a company called Dentcraft in Oklahoma city. And so I went to see, Sid and let him know that I was planning on changing the identity of Kiko and I wanted to get into some of my own products. And what could he tell me about this, these little glue tabs that are some small piece of paintless dent repair. And, uh, I would just say that Sid was very gracious and, and took a, a lot of time and maybe a bit of a liking to my story and what I was trying to do, uh, and help me understand the business a bit. And then we used what we knew about plastics uh, from a design um, and property set uh, perspective to create a plastic tab that was just a little bit better than everybody else's in the uh, paintless dent repair world, right? So that's how that's how it got started. Um, was just the um, probably the most well, certainly largely the most successful uh, thing that we did in two thousand nine. Uh, with regard to branded products. And so then, you know, from there we thought, well, if you can fix a small dent with this thing, why can't you make a bigger tab to fix a bigger dent? Um, and that's, you know, that's where we started heading down that road. But because to your point, you know, because I 
am fairly entrepreneurial. There was a few different things we were doing at that time. I have a, a small um, LED lighting business that I actually bought in, in 2011, and then we were doing a lot of oil field work. Uh, but when the oil field died in 2014, um, that's when we pivoted and put all of our effort, all of our research and development, all of our focus on now creating uh, out of a paint, a small paintless knit repair niche business, creating a um, business that is a collision repair business and a system that is the least invasive, best quality way to fix a dent, right? So that's that's really the process. That's why it took, you know, a number of years, you know, to to get to where, you know, I'm going to say, you know, in, in the late, you know, 17, 18 is when people first started recognizing, you know, who we were and what we were doing. But that's that's kind of the history of the Kiko body repair products side of, of, of who we are. So, Chris, you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about glue pole repair. Um, it's we know it's not like super new, but for some reason lately, there's been a lot of talk about it. And I think one of the reasons is that um, glue pole repair is is friendly to electric vehicles and it's friendly to vehicles that feature a lot of sensitive electronics. So tell me what makes glue pulling an ideal repair method for EVs and vehicles today that you know, have sensitive electronic components in them. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's a, that's a really great question. I think there's, there's a, there's a few reasons for that, Jason. Uh, one being, uh, that electric vehicle manufacturers, because of the weight of the batteries are m- more motivated than ever before, uh, to, cut weight, right? They're, they're trying to cut weight wherever they can in their vehicles and engineer, um, you know, the, the latest types of materials to be able to do that. And the, and then even the techniques of using, you know, multiple materials, right. You know, so, um, they're going to use more and more aluminum in their, uh, body panels. They're going to use more and more super thin, high strength steel. Um, and both aluminum and high strength and really, really thin high strength steels are just inherently more difficult for the welding processes to assimilate to, uh, you know, a- aluminum tends to rip and tear, uh, because there's so many different alloys and really hard to, you know, program in the proper, um, uh, substrate to weld with, with those aluminum repair, uh, systems. So there's challenges and, and then the, you know, when you're, uh, welding, you're going to use small surface area to pull, uh, a big surface area. And when that small surface area is aluminum, then it would tend to have a problem with ripping and tearing, you know? Uh, so our, um, system being, plastic and larger surface area, you know, big, bigger dents in vehicles largely go into those vehicles with large surface area. So it only is intuitive to pull those out with a large surface area, right? So, um, so that aspect of electric vehicles really, you know, the, the aluminum and the super thin high strength steel, those could be, and, and are used on ice vehicles as well but they're just used more often, uh, in, um, EVs because of the fact that they're trying to shed weight so that, and, and that advantage of, you know, one system, whether it's aluminum or a steel panel that, that the glue and, and the, and the tab doesn't care. Right. You know, so it's one system, no matter what, and, and then that ability to not rip and tear in the same way that, uh, aluminum struggles with is, you know, so that's one reason, uh, why it fits very well with EVs. And this, you know, another reason is that, um, the heat issue with panel bonds, right. And, and so, you know, some of those EVs would have, uh, an inner that might be steel and an outer that might be aluminum and, you know, welding, you know, dissimilar materials is really not even possible. So they're using a lot of 
adhesives, panel bonds to be able to put those inners and outers together to create that low weight, high strength structure. And, uh, you know, most of our viewers, if not all of them, uh, will understand that you can't put heat on panel bond because it will um, decrease the strength or maybe uh, compromise the strength of that panel bond. And so uh, glue pull repair is a, is a cold straightening technique. And so being able to uh, use it where you have panel bond and not worry about the heat that you're putting in there is another big reason. And then thirdly, I would say, uh, a big and another big reason is um, every vehicle manufacturer is concerned with road noise and um, insulations to keep from having road noise. But with electrics, it's even a bigger concern because there's no noise to you know, to to mask any of the um, road noise, right? So they're you know they're putting way more insulation panels or way more concerned about any air leaks and things like that, which then is other things that can potentially be burned, you know, catch on fire inside the panel when you start, when you start welding. Awesome. You know, I, I, and I was thinking at the Southeast Collision Conference when I was watching that live demonstration, you know, could I do this? Maybe that's not the right question because I'm pretty much a technological fool when it comes to things like that. I, I'm not a handyman. I can't do this stuff, but I'm looking at it going, is this something I could learn? And and then it got me thinking, you know, is what is the learning curve here? Is 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 glue pulling repair something that takes years to master? Like, say, a paintless dent repair. You know, some paintless dent repair technicians who've been doing it for twenty years. You know, that's why they're good at it because it took so long. But is glue pulling a a skill that takes years to master, or can you learn it in a reasonably short period of time? Yeah, uh, another great question, Jason, and, and I'll, I'll trace back to as you know our roots were in paintless dent repair, right? And so glue pole repair uh, was used in paintless dent repair when there was no access, and, you know, rails and areas where there's no access is really where glue pole repair was limited to at that point. And but it was so it was part of PDR when we created the collision repair system and we brought glue pull, you know, to the, 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 uh, collision repair space, people thought that because we come from PDR and that we've been so selling in PDR and glue pull had only be as been associated with PDR, they thought we were trying to teach them PDR. And what they knew was that they didn't have time to learn PDR which paintless dent repair does take a significant amount of time to be able to um, learn, right, you know, and, and to master. So what we did is we created an acronym of its own. I mean, glue pulling, you know, as something inside of PDR existed, but we, you know, we were together and we created the acronym glue pull repair. And in the acronym glue pull repair, we have created a succinct, process that basically what we're teaching a technician is, listen, you know, you, we're not teaching you paintless dent repair. This is a less invasive collision repair technique, just using glue and tabs. We're going to show you the basics of getting that glue to stick time and time again, and how you choose your tabs and how you choose your lifter. And the answer to that question is, that in one day, if, if, if a collision technician is effectively repairing vehicles with uh, traditional uh, repair methods, in one day, we can teach him what he needs to know to then pivot to uh, glue pull repair and our system to be able to do a less invasive, better quality, many times very fast and faster and, and more efficient sort of repair. You know, we talk a lot about what glue pulling can fix and what it can do. You know, you mentioned, um, you know, it 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 offers a wider area to, with uh, to pull a dent versus a single point, uh, possibly reducing you know uh, the potential to rip aluminum or, um, you know, there's and also you know it doesn't involve heat, so that's another advantage, but. What are, what are things that it can't do? For example, what would be a repair that maybe it's, it's not suitable for? Is there, a, is there a dent that's maybe, you know, too concave that, that it can't take out? Or 
it, what what can it not do? What are, what are the jobs it may not be suitable for? Yeah, that, that's an that's another. Uh, I, I love that question, and you know, there's there's a couple answers to that. And one answer is that, you know, there's, and, and you'd be aware of this as, as much as anybody, Jason, but there's a contingent of repairers out there in the collision space that are doing repairs only to the OEM standard. Uh, and, you know, whatever the OEM procedure is, they're following it, you know, to the absolute nth degree. And then there'd be people that are um, maybe repairing things, uh, that an OEM would say that you shouldn't repair. Right. You know, so let me speak first to the, the repairs that an OEM would say you could repair. Truthfully, there are very few, very few, um, limitations for glue pull repair on what is deemed repairable, you know, by the OEM procedure um you know and because you know the the areas that get the most difficult uh are what i would call multi-structural but you know for instance of you know if, if a door is so ridiculously caved in that the that the inner beam structures um you know compromise that is going to be a repair that glue pole repair is unable to do right you know but truthfully, no repair process, you know, should be used in that scenario, you know? So, so it, it is a, it is a limitation, but yet not an, a, not an effective limitation. Now there would also be, so within now, so let's go back to within the OEM, uh, you know, s specification the, the, within the OEM procedure. The only thing that gets really difficult would be like maybe some very small, diameter um damage near double metal sort of edges you know uh that are really sharp right you know um and and the way that you the way that we repair those a lot of times um it, it's kind of an advanced glue pull repair because we would end up maybe making that dent bigger in order to be able to pull it right you know uh but but there are some limitations when it comes to really hard, um, shots, sharp shots near, uh, double panel edges or like right angle sort of edges. Right. You know, so that, those are, that would, I would call that the, the most, um, you know, common limitation. So. Okay. And going back to learning glue pulling, I assume your company not only sells product uh and uh, and offers uh support after the purchase but training as well uh correct me if i'm wrong but do you guys offer mm -hmm. training and and what does that involve i mean when you when when somebody buys your product they're a customer now uh do they automatically get that training for free or or is there you know is, is, do you offer it but there's another additional cost or how does that work yeah. Uh, so how we handle training is truly our, our entire training curriculum. Everything that we provide in training is available online for free. You know, they, they can go in and self-educate, you know, uh, learn the process. Uh, and, and that is, uh, available for free. But what we, what we find is that, uh, and I, I thought it was a, a really uh, compelling at the last, CIC event I was at it. I think it was uh, Tech Force showed a video and they were talking about um, the fact that it, it was more toward young technicians, but just technicians, um, you know, and young technicians that you know maybe aren't aren't as comfortable in, in a in a classroom. And they held up their hands and they said, "I think with my hands, right?" And and so people who think with their hands tend to want to be taught directly with hands, and so we do go out to shops and we do host training at our own uh, tech center in, here in Oklahoma city. Uh, but you know, that is an additional charge. You know, we will, we'll fly to a shop. We'll train uh, every technician in that shop in a one day training and get them ready to go, ready to, to use glue pole repair effectively, literally in one day. 
um, or will you know we have both basic and more advanced training available at, at our tech center in Oklahoma City as well. You know, Chris, in this industry, we talk about the, the how you get good at something is you do it over and over. For example, in your shop, uh, if there's a plastic bumper specialist, you know, that's the guy. And he should be given those jobs all the time so he gets better and better and better at it. And I think you said that there's not many repairs that couldn't be done with glue pulling. Um, you know, it, it's very rare that that wouldn't qualify as something that glue pulling could do. So therefore, I would think there's plenty of opportunities in a shop to use glue pulling repair and, uh, you know, to dedicate a technician to do that. Is, is that a smart thing to do is to find a guy and say, okay, here's what we have. Here's the training. Here's a kit. And uh, you're going to do this all day, every day. And you're going to get really, really good at it. And we're going to get more efficient at it and more profitable. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good question, Jason. But, you know, I would say that that answer is really based upon the business model of the shop, right? You know, if the business model of the shop is that they have technicians that are specialists in certain areas, uh, then by all means, you know, uh, if they had a specialist that was a glue pull repair specialist, then that person, it, you know, through just the volume of repairs that they do, and then likely going more in depth in training with us, you know, is going to be somebody who we call it a continuum, a glue pull repair continuum from rough out to finish basically. And, you know, the guys that just learn in the rough out stage, they're going to be getting the panel, you know, fairly flat, you know, but flat enough where you're going to need filler and, and refinish. Uh, but if you had a specialist, then they're going to keep uh, honing their craft and getting to a place where it gets uh, closer and closer to a flat finish, closer and closer to chasing a PDR, you know, from if, if that was the model. But yet also, you know, in, in other shops, everyone, you know, is, is a cross-functional uh, team and he does everything. And so he's not going to, you know, maybe get, do as many loophole repairs and maybe not take it as far, but still be very, very effective. And, and again, not burning the front side of the panel, not burning the back side of the panel, getting the advantage of being able to move large surface areas quickly, right? You know, so every technician can do that getting to the finer details and approaching the PDR, that's where it becomes more of a specialist sort of a mentality. And I would say that um, th that is a model that I've seen work for uh, a number of shops, but it only works when that is their model to have specialists in certain areas. You you wouldn't want to try to have a specialist for glue pool repair when you don't have specialists anywhere else. Um, another interesting thing, when you think about um, the technician crisis in uh, in the collision industry today, we're finding we've, we're, we've put in a lot of effort and investment and time and effort into getting the collision repair um, vocational technical centers, the, all the different schools, getting them outfitted with our equipment and our training to be able to provide that. Well, because it is a, a, a lower barrier of entry and in, 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 in understanding and being um, uh, proficient enough to be able to get a pan a, a, a dent minimized quickly and and because you know uh, young people tend to be maybe a, a little bit um, uh, resistant you know to learning welding processes you know when you're grounding things you know they start maybe getting worried about, you know, maybe unfounded worry, but worried about electric shock and things like that. And so when we bring out glue pull repair tools, it almost looks like toys to them and they get excited. And so they can come out of a technical center uh, and take their first job and have a skill that in glue pull repair and using glue pull repair that the seasoned 20, 30 year technician, unless he's had our training it doesn't have right you know so we've been very proud of the fact that we are giving an opportunity to make those apprentices you know valuable on day one in their first job and so that that's been a that's been a fun thing to see you know because because truly what the biggest struggle we have is it, it's, it's just not that difficult to to use a basic glue pull repair 
it is the culture change that's the hard part. You know, as human beings, we just don't embrace change well. And, you know, the the idea of culture change is really the uh, the biggest challenge that we have. And with a young person, we don't have that challenge. So um, that, that's been one nice way to to be able to have a, a, a young person that actually almost is a specialist, you know, when they get their first job. Well, Chris, I want to thank you for being on Body Shop Business, the podcast today. You know, glue pulling is red hot right now. We're seeing you at trade shows. We're seeing live demonstrations at SEMA. Uh, we know other companies are promoting glue pull repair and the products they have for it. Um, it's really a topic of discussion now. We're seeing it being chatted up on in social media and other places. So I really appreciate your time. I know you've educated me a lot on the glue pull repair process today, and I'm sure uh, you'll educate everybody else who sees this. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, thank you so much, Jade. I I really appreciate it. I've been saying for really a couple of years that you know the that there's really not enough talk about glue pull repair because it is we you know, it is changing the industry, right? You know, and so I, I so much appreciate you guys recognizing that and giving uh, an opportunity and a platform for us to be able to give some education uh, around it, you know, because, you know, it, it's it, it's funny, in uh, 2017, 18 period of time, I started telling people we're, we're going to change how collision repair is done. And, um, you know, people thought we were crazy, but, uh, we're, we weren't crazy because it, cause it's happening. Um, and it, it's just the perfect storm of, uh, vehicle technology creating the need for a less invasive repair. And, um, you know, blue pole been around for a while, but we, we approach it differently with process with patented products. And, and it has been something that, uh, the, the industry has, has welcomed, right? You know, so it, it really, it's, it's, it, it's been, it's been fun. We're, we're, we're thankful. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you. I'm Jason Stahl. Thanks for watching. Thanks everybody for tuning in to Body Shop Business, the podcast. Check out bodyshopbusiness.com for more podcasts.